All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I will pray for us. Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk through your word. Uh, thank you for the beauty of it, the power, uh, the transforming power in your word. Uh, you say, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And we want to think your thoughts after you, and we recognize that it's unlikely that we as creatures would be able to fully understand what you see, but you tell us to ask, and so we ask, uh, would you open our minds to the scriptures? Would you help us ask great questions? Would you uh, cause the truths that are in this part of your word uh, to be life-giving in our lives? And we make this prayer in no way claiming inherent superiority over anyone or a natural born right, but we come asking this because our Lord Jesus has lived the perfect life on our behalf, has died for our sins, and promised one day our complete conformity to your uh, character and will. And so would you bless us today because of what he has done for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So we're <coughs> two of 28. We're looking at pericopes. I, I guess that's how you say it, pericopes, uh, uh, 15 to 28. So what does pericope mean? Paragraph, and what are the numbers? They're the numbers in our, in our textbook. So uh, some of the stories will have multiple pericopes because they try to explore every possible chronological uh, relationship. So there are going to be times where it's like, oh, we've already done the feeding of the 5,000, but we're going to do those based on each one of the um, possible chronologies. So there are 366 pericopes, I think. So if we do 28, if my math is right, we'll do 14. So we're on the second set of 14 uh, today. And please take attendance quiz. Did it turn on at uh, 12, uh, 3? Hey, <laughs> it's always nice when technology works. Uh, so before we dive into stuff that I felt was really interesting, what did you find uh, interesting as you worked through the um, uh, the homework together. Yes, and I should know your name, but tell me your name. David. David. I am sorry, I did That's not okay. remember that. I noticed that, I thought it was interesting that a lot of them between the four were like word for word verbatim, and it obviously left space for them <coughs> leaving out other words, but a lot, a bigger portion than I was expecting was just verbatim. Verbatim, like, like English Absolutely, kind of word to word. Greek. Yeah. If it's if it translates verbatim into Greek as well, but I thought it, it was interesting. And what's weird in the Greek version, they actually line the words up so that when it <coughs> does the word for word, they put it on the same exact. So, like you can see, and that raises, does it not, the synoptic problem? It's like some portions of this are like word for word verbatim, like sentences long, and then other things aren't word for word verbatim. And so people have thought, uh, okay, there's literary dependence, or maybe there was a common story and people memorized it, and then our authors added explanation in some ways, it uh, can be impossible to prove that, but like those are the ideas. And so you've met uh, firsthand. It is that word for word part that's kind of intriguing when we're trying to understand what's going on. And then places where they don't agree, um, uh, and each one is giving a different detail. It's like, what, what's going on there? So, and A lot of times, the places where it disagrees or explains something differently, it's right in between verbatim and verbatim, and it's just this one little, this 
Right, yeah. one little center, uh, and th there are places where, like, Mark will have half a verse from Luke and half a verse from Matthew, and he'll put it together in his saying. So, do you th do you think Mark had both of them and drew it together? Or do you think they both had Mark and just happened to split the sentence, or did? or is there literary dependence uh, at all? So it's intriguing when you start working through this synopsis to see there is something really weird going on with these stories and how they depend on each other. It's good. And uh, don't tell me. Let me think about your name, but uh, go ahead and, because uh, I should have your name already. I have worked on your name. <laughs> probably not an important point, but I did find it interesting because Matthew and Luke can be pretty detail-oriented at times, both of them, in different ways, but um, they, um, they have a different order of the of there, events that happen. To each there's person. a different order, um, and um, it's okay when we study the Bible, when you come to something and you're confused about it, don't freak out. I used to freak out. Uh, like, uh, I was talking to someone when we uh, uh, came in and the uh, first time I took a class, this wasn't my actual book, but like I had the Greek version of this and uh, it was at a state school and the professor was doing everything he could to like move us away from evangelicalism. And I remember um, like seeing, wow, these are in different things. Like, what do I do about that? And the state school where I went, um, the campus was right downtown and they had, had a, used to have a thing called a Christian bookstore. You may have never seen one, but there actually used to be Christian bookstores. And I remember like, making a beeline to go find some help. Um, like, what do I do with this? This seems like a, a contradiction between these two stories. I've come to see uh, over the years that uh, the Bible is like an anvil and when the hammers bang down on it, it's not the anvil that gives way, it's the hammers that wear out. and uh, just kind of from the perspective of 40 plus years in biblical studies, uh, there isn't anything we will ever look at that lots of other people haven't looked at too. And if there were the error that was going to prove the Bible wasn't true, we would all know about it long, long ago, people. Uh, but there is, uh, it's a fact that Matthew has a different order and Luke, and we're going to ask the question, why is it in a different order? And what is it exactly that Matthew says? And what is it exactly that Luke says in regard to what looks like a contradiction in uh, chronology? So my dull brain didn't get it. Will you tell me your name? Mackenzie. <coughs> Mackenzie. I almost had it the other day. I, I knew it was a very dignified name, but I couldn't. Sometimes I'll... Uh, like, okay, it's a dignified name and it starts with, but like I couldn't get what it starts with, but maybe maybe now my brain will catch up. So thank you, Mackenzie. What else did you find? Yes. Uh, and remind me of your name. I sh Kennedy. Kennedy. I had your name a year ago. I don't know what <laughs> happened, but proof that God saves people who think slowly sometimes. So Kennedy.
Yeah, baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Um, <coughs> Mark doesn't mention the fire part. Um, Matthew does talk about burning with unquenchable fire. And so, like, what exactly is going on there? Like, what, what is it exactly that John is saying, and when we have all four stories, what do each of those four stories help us understand? That's a fantastic observation, Kennedy. What, what else? Marty. He's like wishy, wishy, I'll die with you. And then like an hour later, he's yeah. cursing that he does it. But I did have a specific question. And I, I unfortunately don't remember which book it, did, it was. But um, near the end of one that I believe was somewhere after uh, the temptation passage, um, Jesus said that you will see the day when the angels descend or something like Ascend and these that's the end of um, John 1. Yeah, I could not for the life of me figure out what it was referring to, and maybe that's normal knowledge, but I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I remember having that exact same question. Uh, eventually, over the years, I started getting in the habit of looking up cross references. Does anybody have a cross reference in their Bible? to this verse, it's actually referen referencing an event that happened in the Old Testament. Angels descending and ascending. It's Jacob's ladder and uh, he is fleeing for his life. He's crossing the Jordan God shows up. Um, uh, Jacob makes kind of an interesting proposition to God, and he says, if you're good to me, if you give me clothes, if you protect me, if you do this, then I'll tithe and you'll be my God. That's what he says. Which... He's Jacob's God, whether he does anything. So it's like, if, 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 if. Um, and there's no evidence that Jacob ever fulfilled that vow that he made to God. And perhaps he did, but there's nothing in the Bible that says he did. And yet God was still good to him. Um, and when he wakes up, he builds what's called a pillar, and he anoints it. What's weird about that is the Pentateuch said, don't build pillars to God. So like, and then he calls that pillar um, Bethel. Anybody's Hebrew good enough to know what Bethel? House of God. So he calls this thing, and it's in the vision that God shows up and meets with him this ladder comes down from heaven and the angels are coming down to earth and then going back up to God. And Jacob said, this is Bethel. This is the gate of heaven. So what's Jesus saying? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes. And how does it relate to him? Yeah, yeah. He's the way people get into heaven. He's the way people, angels come to heaven, like it's all about him. Uh, I think it's Nathaniel had kind of slammed Jesus for being from Nazareth. I guess that was a despicable place. And, and Jesus says uh, that he kn knew Nathaniel and Nathaniel said, when did you see me? And he said, well, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. We don't know what they were talking about. The two of them know, but it's like Nathaniel says, you're the son of God, you know. And Jesus said, because I saw you under the fig tree, you'll see greater things. In fact, you'll see this. So, And I'm always intrigued by that fig tree thing because you could argue that that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and like I saw you when you were in, in your parents trying to hide your sin uh, you know so I don't know what's going on there but it is interesting and the cross reference it's a cross reference to help me see that it's referencing the uh, Jacob story and I I think it may be like verbatim uh, in the Jacob uh, story there. Best commentary on the Bible, say it with me, is the Bible. So the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Uh, because God's an effective uh, interpreter. Uh, anybody else, something that you found interesting? Pericopes 15 to... Uh, 28, I think is what we did. Uh, all right. Well, there are three things I want to look at. And the first is the baptism of Jesus. Did anybody um, like circle it mentally or make a note that uh, at least two of the accounts, I think, maybe all three of them, have this phrase, he saw the heavens having been split open. Like, what, what is that? And Luke, um, I should have another quotation mark there, but Luke tells us that when the baptism happened, he was about 30 years old. That seems weird to me. So I want to know, does anywhere else in Scripture talk about the heavens being split open? And I remember going to my computer thing and saying, you know, where is this word? And it took me somewhere, uh, McKinsey. It's close. You are very, very close. And it may say the heavens split open there, but that's not the one I'm thinking of, but it very well could be there as well. As well. It, if you have a good cross-reference Bible, the Luke passage probably has a cross-reference to it. I have a Greek Bible that has really good cross-reference, but I thought, you know, if I bring two books in a folder and a Greek New Testament, I'll probably look like a geek. So, I don't know. I left it there, but I, I did find it. Yes? Uh, well, let's look at it. What, what does it say? Um, the same appearance took place at Stephen's death. And uh, does it say there, as Stephen died, the heavens were split? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, he sees Jesus. Uh, they're killing him, and Jesus 
as far as I know, is the only place in Scripture where Jesus in heaven stands for anyone. But he stood uh, for Stephen at his death. Uh, any other cross references the heavens having been split open? I'll give you a hint. It's an Old Testament book I really love. I was wondering, I don't have my, I didn't bring my Bible with me, but Elijah, when he was taken up into heaven, was it split open then? I, I think it may be there, and he, he, he Elijah prays that the eyes of his serpent a servant would be open and he sees this massive army of God uh, it may be that wasn't the one I was thinking of but it may be that uh, that has the thing as well Savannah I'm reading from, is it Ezekiel or Ezekiel? it is in Ezekiel <laughs> in fact it's in the very first verse in Ezekiel Matter of fact, it is a vision that Ezekiel saw when he's 30 years old. He'll read it for us. Kinsey? Um, who can tell me about 30 years old uh, anywhere in the Bible? Uh, and would that, I'm guessing, be Numbers 447? Somebody want to read that for us? Did you know that when you became a priest, you didn't just become a priest whenever you wanted, that you became a priest when you turned 30 years old and then you served uh, the priesthood from 30 until a fixed year. Uh, what, what does it tell us? So read 47 now. I think, uh, no, numbers 447. From 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, all the terms of duty or work of service and the work of bearing burdens so the years of active service for a Levite is when? 50. Oh. And how do you become a priest? Uh, remind me. What ceremony do you go, go through to become a priest? You get washed, and does anybody wash you, or does like it have to be a person from a certain tribe washes you? You have to be washed by a Levite, you know, so Moses washes Aaron. Oh, somebody washed. Oh, and he's a Levite. Oh, I bet we're the only people who've ever thought of that. I wonder what year David became king. I don't know, but I'm just going to go on a limb. I'll bet it's 2 Samuel 5, 4. Who will read that for us? I got you. David was 30 years old when he became king and reigned 40 years. Huh, so the quintessential king became king at 30. The priest become priest at 30, and a really cool prophet becomes prophet at 30. And when he became the prophet, he saw the heavens split open. And Jesus, the perfect prophet, priest, and king, came to the Jordan River when he was 30 years old. He was washed by a Levite. And remind me, could Moses get people in the land flowing with milk and honey? 
they had to wait for a really cool guy. What was that guy's name? And in Greek, what was it? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, okay. Maybe these stories are connected. Uh, maybe God is like this grand artist who like hides things. <coughs> Have any of you guys ever heard? Uh, you know the uh, program Microsoft. Microsoft Excel. Has anybody used it? Do you know? I don't know if it still does. But did you know that program used to have things in it called Easter eggs? Have you ever heard of this before? Programmers would like create these like secret games and if you went to the right thing and you typed in the right formula, it would unlock this game and you could play it. And like Bill Gates didn't want that in his stuff. And Microsoft didn't want that in his stuff, but the programmers thought it'd be kind of <coughs> funny to like put all this cool stuff hidden there, you know, and you kind of stumble across it. And uh, a friend of mine says, yeah, they call those things Easter eggs. And like the, eventually Microsoft had to threaten the programmers, you, you guys stop putting uh, Easter eggs uh, in these programs. Uh, what if God has put Easter eggs in the Bible for us? Like really cool things that if you want to skip over it, it's like skip over it. But like the moment you start giving God the benefit of the doubt, like you find these things. I don't know. I wonder. Um, What about this phrase, you are my son, my beloved son? So in Greek, that's ha huios mu ha agapetos. You're probably familiar with the term agapetos. Do you know that's a verbatim quote from, I think it's um, maybe Genesis 22, it may be something like Genesis 22.2 or Genesis 22.3. Anybody want to look that up? Uh, what do, you're smiling. What is it? <laughs> So I had never seen this until this summer. So you know how I always do that class about where was the Garden of Eden? I try to make a case that it was Jerusalem. And then, oh, you've got these like. So all this summer I'm writing this article and I'm reading all these, uh, you know, scholarly things and I'm just getting depressed. You know, it's like everybody's written on this. Everybody has an idea. None of them agree. Uh, and, like, I'm just, I'm just depressed, like, reading all this secondary literature. And then I ask myself, uh, Judd, what's the one thing you haven't read this summer? And it's like, well, the Hebrew text of Genesis. That, you know, if you're looking to figure out what Genesis is uh, saying, it might be cool to read the Hebrew text of Genesis. Oh my goodness, I started reading that and it just I felt life coming back to my body. You know, I'm happy again. Like, this is so clear. Have you ever made this connection? Adam and Eve get kicked out of the land flowing with milk and honey, right? What does God say to Abraham the very first thing in 12.1? When he shows up to Abraham, he talks about blessing him, but he gives him a very specific promise about something. What is that promise in 12, 1 to 3? David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. 
and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all, uh, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God promises he's going to do what? One of the very first parts of that promise, what's he going to do? Leave your land and go to, what does he say? The land I will show you. Now, just in terms of literature, if, if we didn't think the Bible was true and like it was the word of God, if we only thought it was literature, would you think the land had anything to do with the land that Adam lost? Yeah, pr pretty much a kindergartner could, like, make that. I mean, if, if we were reading Green Eggs and Ham and you had a land lost and I'll show you the land, I mean, you don't have to be, like, a rocket science genius <laughs> to think that those two might be related. Do you know who does it connect those two path, those two parts of the Bible? 500 years of scholarship on where's the Garden of Eden. So I don't know. I'm just saying, you tell me. Uh, uh, I, I think a child could make that and, like, it's not made in the secondary literature. Do you know if we were Jews that that section of Scripture has a peculiar name? And take, you might know what it is doing the, the synagogue uh, messianic synagogue readings, but what, what do they call that section? I think it's Lake Lakah. It's the Lake Lakah, the get up and go for yourself. And that's <laughs> like in the synagogue readings, they don't have chapter 12, they just have these sections. And that's, I think it's the third synagogue reading, second, it may be the second one, but it's early and they call it the Lake Lakah. Can I ask a question? Does Lake Laka appear anywhere else in Scripture? I'll give you a hint. We may have just read it in that. What is this story in Genesis 22? Like right, he goes out into the land where? The same mountain where? Oh, I'm getting, oh my goodness, the same mountain. Okay, and what was built on that mountain like a thousand years after? What was built there? <coughs> Tell me. I don't want to be wrong. Uh, was it like a, like a temple? Or like, like a temple? temple? Or the temple. And, and inside the temple, like, were there figures? What were those figures? Help me. Aren't they like cherubs? Yeah, and where's the only other place in the Bible you run into cherubs? In front of the tree of knowledge. No, the tree of life. The tree of life. Oh. <coughs> and the tree of life is where? I don't know. I'm just going to go way out on a limb and think that the Bible is helping me see that maybe the Garden of Eden and Jerusalem are connected. I know nobody at Harvard thinks that. <laughs> I think the Bible thinks that. Certainly the Garden of Eden is going to be restored to Jerusalem. Do you find it interesting that when Jesus shows up, God quotes Genesis 22? 
I mean, look at those readings. The only difference in those readings is one letter of me versus of you. It's the same five words in the same order. That seems significant to me. Now, when Abraham went to that place, was there a temple built? Might there have been a temp might there have been something there before? Maybe that was <coughs> cursed and maybe overgrown or something. Would it be cool if it happened at the same place? How cool do you think God is? Do you think God's clever enough to like do things at the same place at the same time to the very day? Oh my goodness, I never saw that before. Do you think God's in heaven going to say, Oh my, I never saw that. Well, wow, that is so cool. I wish I had come up with it. Do you think God's going to say that? <laughs> or is the God of Scripture the kind of God who says it's the glory of God to hide things in the glory of kings to search them out? Does God ever like to hide stuff? Easter eggs for us to find. It's interesting, when I was at state school, many people on the faculty, not everyone, but many people on the faculty just seemed like it was their calling in life to destroy people's faith in God. It's like, I, I remember reading through that and the, the guy would just point out everything that he thought was wrong, you know. But he never saw, or at least he never talked to us about the cool stuff that was there. I wonder why. So I don't know. I think uh, the baptism of Jesus is uh, um, interesting. I didn't add it here, but I think we could probably just muse on, on it together. Does the idea of Jesus going into water relate to any other stories in the Bible? Fisher, I see you nodding. Uh, what comes to mind? I mean, I definitely wasn't smart enough to come up with this, but um, the story of Noah's Ark and the, uh, so, the concept of Big space in the, the midst of deadly waters. Uh, any other stories? Marty? Yeah, that Jesus is getting washed for all of us, I guess. Sarah? And then Jonah being thrown into the <laughs> sea. Salvific <laughs> space. And the, the, and the difference is Jesus wants Nineveh to be saved and Jonah doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that that was three days that he was in the well and then spit out, and it was three years even, like, between Jesus when he that's was baptized at 30 and then 33. That's exactly right. And I wish I put the map up here, but do you know the Old Testament tells us what uh, Jonah's hometown is? If you have a phone, you can look it up. Or um, uh, it, His name's only mentioned in one verse outside of the book of Jonah, but it tells us where he, uh, he's from. Any, anybody uh, find that, what Jonah's hometown was? Well, it, it doesn't say Nazareth, but it does tell us the name of the place. Gath Heifer? Gath Heifer. And 
Gath usually means wine press something, so whatever heifer means. If you took time to look it up on a map where Gath heifer was, and Fisher, this is going to bring you to what your hunch was. Where is Gath heifer going to be in New Testament times? Two point two miles from what city? Nazareth. From right here to halfway to the Walmart is the difference from where Jonah lived and where Jesus lived. Could, could be a coincidence. I doubt it. <laughs> And it's funny, the, the experts in the law say to Nicodemus, read the Old Testament and no prophet ever came from Nazareth. Really? I thought, no, I thought Jonah came from Nazareth, but hey, that's just in the Bible. And you got more important books to read and stuff. Why, why read the Bible? I mean, <laughs> what? Let's give our life to secondary literature, not uh, not what the Bible actually says. Uh, sorry, that's ungracious of me. Yeah. Um, what else? Salvific space in the midst of deadly waters. Where else? That's in Joshua and all the Israelites crossed. And where where was that crossing? I think it is the same place. The baptism happened. The exact same place. The baptism. Happened in what's Jesus' name in Greek? Remind me. Oh, uh, and okay. Uh, and I guess the whole Red Sea thing too, salvific space. And I guess creation, God splits the abyss. And I guess while we're at it, uh, Revelation 15, and you know the fiery waters split and. Sing the song of Moses when you get to the other side. Huh, all that happened, like, connected to this story. I don't know. I find that interesting. Okay, so what do we do about this? And Mackenzie, I'm so glad that you uh, read exactly the way I read because, like, this gives me problems. Uh, so Matthew's order is bread. Does Matthew have a temporal word in his description? Uh, and so whenever you get stuff like this, often you're going to have to go to the text and look carefully at the word. And when it you get really deep in the weeds, uh, you're going to have to go to the original and look. Does Matthew have a temporal order word um, in terms of when the testing happened? And what, what is that word? Then. then. Uh, so Matthew says this happened then this happened. And does Matthew say he again took Jesus to the mountain? Does Matthew say that in terms of like verbatim? So what does the word again uh, imply? That he took him to the mountain before. And then that's where there was a temptation to worship Satan. Now when Luke describes this story, his first one is a bread temptation. Does he have a temporal word with the worship temptation? Or does he say, and? <coughs> what does he say? 
He says, and. He did this, and he did that. <coughs> Just in terms of a technical point, does the word and imply chronological order? It does. I mean, tota implies chronological order. This happened, then this happened. Luke is saying this happened and this happened. Let me ask it a different way. What is Matthew trying to do in terms of his gospel? Who's he trying to reach? Jews. Does Israel have temptations in the desert? What is the order of those temptations? What's the first way they test God? And just food in general or? And he's tired of the man and he wants a woman. I, th I think that might be the second one. I don't know, I could be confused, but the first one is a food one. Can God feed us? What's the second one they do? Can God feed us good food? <laughs> and what do they do? They put God to the... They put God to the, to the test. And then when Moses is getting the Ten Commandments, do they like mess up with something? Like he's on the top of the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and they said, all the Lord said we will do. But what are they actually doing while he's getting that law on the top of Mount Sinai? They're worshiping a golden calf, and what are they calling that golden calf? <coughs> Yahweh. So I've got a bread temptation, a testing God temptation, and a worship temptation. If I'm trying to convince Jews of the glory of Jesus or Jesus' centrality, what might I be pointing out in terms of what Jesus did in the wilderness? And where was Israel when they faced these temptations? Where were they? They, they were in the wilderness. Oh, Jesus is in the wilderness. And, oh, okay, these stories might be related. If I'm Matthew, might there be a reason that I want to give the precise order, the chronological order, now, what does Luke say about the information he gives us? What did he say verbatim, pericope 1? What did he say that he did? An orderly account. What, was he there? So how did he find his information? He talked to people. Oh, Jesus was tempted. Tell me about the temptations. Bread, uh, worship, testing God. Is that false, what Luke said? Did Luke say this happened, then this happened, then this? Luke doesn't say that. He says this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And he does say, I mean, Matthew does say that they had gone to the mountain twice. He implies that. So is it maybe this? But I can tell you what this is not. Did Luke copy Matthew?
if you were on a jury and somebody came in and gave testimony and then left and the second person came in and they told you the same exact story in the exact same words with no difference, would you think these two people are telling the truth to me or would you think something else? You would think they made that up, they got their story straight, they, they memorized that paragraph. Is that what we have in the temptation story? It's not. Whatever you say about Luke and Matthew, they're not copying each other, in, at least in this story. Uh, Priscilla. We're not going to look at it today, but we are going to look at it down the road, and it's something that you'll need to um, talk about when you, uh, on the uh, final, when you talk about the synoptic problems. Matthew and Mark uh, have the feeding of the 5,000. Months go by, Matthew and Mark have the feeding of the 4,000. And then Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus had a miraculous boat ride and a miracle happened. Luke has the feeding of the 5,000 has nothing from the feeding of the 5,000 through the feeding of the 4,000 but tells the story of the miraculous boat ride. Scholars call this the great omission. Is it wrong that there's a miraculous boat ride after the feeding of the 5,000 defending Luke's perspective? Is that a mistake? Or was there a miraculous boat ride after the feeding of the 5,000 happened? Luke seems unaware of the feeding of the 4,000. Does Luke claim that he was a disciple or he was there? No, he talked, he wrote down what he found. Was there a feeding of the 5,000? Yes. Was there a miraculous boat ride? Yes. If Luke had Mark or Matthew, how do you explain not telling the stuff that happened between the two? That becomes very difficult to explain because he would have had a written uh, text, but he doesn't have any of that material. So. I don't know, and so to Priscilla's point, is it possible that there was more than three temptations? I, I, the, nothing in the text, because I went back and, well, I don't think in the, anything in the text says that there were just three temptations. And I think the word again implies that there's more going on than uh, uh, just what uh, he recorded. John tells us at the end, if everything was written down, what Jesus said and did, John says the whole world couldn't uh, cope with the books. Uh, so I, I'm not sure exactly how to harmonize these, but I know that they're not giving this the exact story with the exact same words here. I wonder if Matthew isn't helping us see that this is exactly paralleling Israel's temptations in the desert, that Jesus is the truly obedient Israel, just like Israel went through the water 
and then faced temptation and were meant to be missionaries to the world, Jesus went through water, went in the desert. He succeeded where they failed, and then he ultimately created 12 disciples and then 70. There are 70 in the table of nations, and uh, Luke's helping us see that these are meant to fill the promise uh, to all the nations. So I, I'm not ex exactly sure if I'm right on there, but I do think it's interesting that it says he took him again to the mountain. That seems to imply that he'd already taken him. Um, and Matthew is giving us temporal words where Luke is just saying this happened and this happened and this happened. I, I think the third one doesn't even have and. Uh, I think the third one in Luke just and this happened and then he gives that. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I do think there might be a comparison with Adam's temptation in the garden because in Mark, what happens in Mark, uh, what happens at the very end after Jesus is obedient? What happens to the animals? Mark's the only one who tells us about the animals. What do the animals do? What are the animals not doing to each other in the presence of Jesus? <coughs> They're not killing each other. Jesus obeyed and what's happening? <coughs> it's like the Garden of Eden is breaking out around Jesus. Jesus is obedient, and I don't know, have you ever thought about that? Adam comes to a garden, turns it into a tomb. Jesus comes to a tomb and throws open the, the gates to the Garden of uh, Eden. Maybe the land that I will show you is not just a physical land, but it's an emotional land where a father sacrifices his son. Maybe it's a land where the new Adam has obeyed God enough to earn the covenant blessings. If this were written in Hebrew, it would be the son of Adam. That's what it is in the Hebrew text. So, uh, questions or comments? Uh, don't let me push us on too fast. Uh, But you can't go in, yeah. But then, you know, now you have the sense of like, oh, look at the promised land. I can get succeed. Oh, that, I never put that together. That's exactly what the devil is doing. That is interesting. I never really saw that before. I think Jesus is saying, you do whatever you want. And the devil says, well, I'm going to kill you. And the devil kills him. And in the process, <laughs> Jesus redeems all those who are coming. It's like, oh man, that was a bad move. <laughs> so, so now we're going to have to wrestle with something. And I think I'm right about this, and there are other scholars too, but you're going to have to decide this for yourself if you think this is right. Uh, there are good scholars who say no to this, and there are good scholars who say yes. Do you think that John is filling in the gaps of the Synoptic Gospels? In other words, when you read through John, is John presupposing that we know the Synoptic Gospels and writing stuff to fill in the gaps, or is he just writing his gospel? I think he's filling in the gaps. 
and I want to make my argument, but ultimately you get to be the jury. So there's a problem in the Synoptic Gospel chronology when you compare that with John. And let me see if I can walk us through it. And you'll want to look this up in your Bible if you have a paper Bible, non you probably want to have a Bible here and the synopsis because sometimes we need to just look at the Bible. Can anybody read what Mark 1.14 says? It may be 14 and 15, but I think it's 14. Who will read it for us? So when does Jesus start his public ministry in Mark? Is it before or after John's thrown in prison? It's after. And if you go down and read a few more verses, it's after John's thrown in prison that Jesus calls the disciples, right? Is it the next paragraph where uh, he's at the lake and Peter, uh, Andrew, James, and John follow. So we've got a, a marker that that is after John's thrown in prison. And so the call of the disciples is after John's thrown in prison. What does John 3.23 say? And if somebody will read it verbatim for us. Okay. Um, John also was baptizing at Anon, the nearest Roman, because water was coming from there, and people were baptized. No, and people were coming and being baptized. And does, does part of that verse say John had not yet been thrown in prison? Um, that's in Acts 4. In 24, John had not. So according to John, Jesus meets the disciples <laughs> in John chapter 1. He turns the water into wine in John chapter 2. He talks with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. They make a journey back from Jerusalem through Samaria, and Jesus meets the woman at the well. And all that happened before John was thrown into prison. If you presuppose, as I am, that John is saying, okay, I know you've read the Synoptic Gospels. You know the order. Let me tell you what else happened. One of the very helpful ways to read John is to realize John is presupposing we know this. There are 130 uh, miracles in the Synoptic Gospels. There are eight in John. Of those eight, only two of them are in the Synoptic Gospels. Nearly everything in John happens in Jerusalem. Nearly everything in the Synoptics happens in um, Galilee. So it seems to me that what John is telling us is you know about the formal call when they leave everything and live with Jesus from there on out. Well, let me tell you about the first time he met Jesus. What's interesting in John, in the synoptics, what do James and John, 
whose mother is probably the Virgin Mary's sister. We'll, we'll get into that when we, but like, do they ask for something um, of Jesus and their mother asks for something for them from Jesus? What do they ask? Yeah, I know you're going to the Messiah, you're going to be enthroned, but would it be okay if my two boys had like thrones on e either side? Uh, does that seem a little conceited to you? I mean, like. Sounds like something they can't quite ask of their nephew. Yeah. Do you know that nowhere in the Gospel of John does John mention his own name? Do you know that nowhere in the Gospel of John is James, John's brother, mentioned by name? Most people think that when it says two disciples, two disciples of John the Baptist followed Jesus and then it says one of them was Andrew, as an intelligent reader, do you have a question like two disciples followed and one of them was Andrew do you have an intelligent reader question it doesn't tell us who the other one was who was he <laughs> I wonder if it isn't John like and John isn't so because did you pick up in John that he says this happened and on the next day this happened and on the next day this happened and on the next day this happened and then three days later this that sounds like somebody who was there and you know uh, and I don't know I was reading it this morning uh, <coughs> when it talks about uh, I think it's in four in John 4, it says, oh yeah, there were people uh, uh, with John the Baptist and there was a Jew there who was arguing with uh, uh, the disciples of John the Baptist. I wonder who that one Jew was who was arguing. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, has he, he become so humble that he's not even He's not even saying, hey, I was the guy. Now he's like almost <laughs> invisible. Uh, but I don't know. Doesn't Jesus do that to people where they become less proud the longer? Uh, so I don't know. You'll have to make up your own mind what you think is going on. I think that John is presupposing that we've read this, not the Gospels. And and it's going to come to a head when we read um, John 21 because there I think you can prove that he's got Luke's version of the miracle that happened earlier. It's clear he's telling us the differences between uh, the two there. And, and even the feeding of the 5,000, John tells us two details about that that happen to be the exact two details that help us connect it to another passage so I, I think you can make the case that he's um, presupposing we've read but not all scholars think that so you know the idea uh, go through and see what you think that's, that's what I think so all of this I think John is adding and saying yes the formal call where they left their jobs and just live with Jesus was after John, but all this other stuff happened too. Um, so this is the pericope, uh, these are the pericope numbers. <coughs> and you can see if John's filling in the gap, um, that might explain what's going on. And it might explain uh, this as well. So this is the cleansing of the temple. 
which John puts very early in Jesus' ministry. What's true of Luke 19? There are 24 chapters, or Mark, uh, there are 16 chapters, or uh, Matthew 28 uh, chapters. Where do Matthew and Mark and Luke put the cleansing of the temple versus where John puts it? Yeah, it's the, these are the last week of Jesus' life. This is before the formal call. If John's filling in the gaps, he's saying, I know you know that Jesus cleansed the temple the final week, but let me tell you about the other time he did it. And if you go read the story, it is slightly different how he cleanses the temple the first time. And what he says is slightly different. So I think, yes, it's parallel in terms of cleansing the temple, but I think there are actually two cleansings. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give us the first one, and John is giving, or give us the last one, and John is giving us the first one. And I think John, John's account, it says he made a whip to drive people out. And it, I don't think the synoptic gospels say he made a whip. So it seems to me that this is two different um, events. And it is interesting that all the accounts in Jesus' trial say, uh, dis they accuse Jesus, he said that destroy this temple and I will raise it up. All the synoptics agree that. That's not said in the synoptic version, but it is said in John's version. So it seems like even the synoptic, synoptic versions are implying that Jesus actually said something like what John verbatim says he said in John uh, 2. This is not the only place where things like this happen, where Jesus does similar miracles. Uh, I, I think a good number of those are actually two different miracles, but we're going to have to look. And um, I think this is two different uh, events. Well, I think that's what I have uh, for you today. Uh, any uh, comments? If not, I will see you on Thursday.